So it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Rachel Sandcliffe. She's been the chief exec of the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare in Oxford for a while now and has really been one of the pioneers in this field and has built the approach, developed a team and does brilliant stuff with people. So we're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, Rachel. No pressure. Here. No pressure. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, lovely to see you all here today. Thanks for coming back after lunch. Um, that's a picture of me 10 years ago, I'm afraid. I need a new one done. <laughs> um, we all do, probably. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about green plans and in particular about sustainable models of care. So uh, the centre is a charity. We're based in Oxford, but we work nationally and, and to some extent internationally. And uh, as Fiona said, we've been working for a while now, over 15 years. Um, and, and I'll say a bit more about how we've been working. But basically, we, we work with um, individuals and organisations to support the health system to, to change, to become more sustainable. So... Um, We've developed various programs over the years, and, and I have to say that when we started, we definitely didn't know what we were doing, and we didn't have a grand plan. So we just have started doing things with people uh, on the ground as they needed support and developing programs from that. So we now have a range of programs, um, and I'll talk through some of them. But mainly they are, they really focused on equipping healthcare professionals uh, and organisations with uh, the methods and the metrics that they need for sustainable models of care. And related to net zero, um, we've developed a lot of resources and tools and, and things over the years uh, to support health organisations. And sustainability is, of course, the wider thing that we would all like. Uh, net zero is a very urgent part of that. So what do we mean by sustainable models of care? Um, we are guided by the principles of sustainable clinical practice, which um, Francis, who was one of the first people I recruited to work with us, uh, came up with about 12 or 13 years ago now. And they are these. Um, and we use them in, in a lot of what we do. So, so firstly, we talk about prevention. And we heard a lot about that this morning. Um, but basically, you know, we, we want to promote health and prevent disease at any point of the pathway. And some of that is really upstream, you know, talking about the causes of illness and the wider determinants of health. Other parts of it are potentially secondary prevention, so um, to further down uh, into the care pathway. We look at patient self-care, so we want to empower patients to take a bigger role in managing their own, uh, their own health and and health care and um, that that is not to put the onus back on individuals all the time but obviously patients have a massive uh, role to play then we talk about lean service delivery and that is uh, a well established thing within uh, within healthcare but obviously it's hard to do and um, I think the easy way of thinking about that is to think about uh, that we we don't do anything that um, adds uh, th that doesn't add value. So basically, um, cutting out waste. And then we talk about low carbon alternatives. So uh, that's probably quite obvious to all of you. So one of the one of the ways that we've worked um, because we we want to embed this in the system, and um, one of the things that we've uh, we've done over the years is to think about how how change happens in a big system like the NHS. So um, one of the things that, uh, that, that clinicians will know is that when we, have, uh, we want to make a change in the system, we look at quality improvement. And um, embedding sustainability in that is an approach uh, which uh, improves healthcare, but it also can address um, planetary sustainability uh, in terms of the triple bottom line. So uh, in SUSQI, we look at the embedding these principles of sustainable clinical practice. And um, I'll just talk about a little bit more about this uh, value equation, because uh, we've talked about the triple bottom line before now. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about how we do that. 
So sustainable value, um, obviously what we all want is the best outcomes for patients, but we also think more broadly about populations. So when you're a GP, if you're a GP, uh, you're seeing lots of patients come through the door, but you also um, have a responsibility to the wider population. You have a responsibility to those people who aren't coming through the door. And, um, and to some extent, that is the domain of public health, but it's actually a really important part of what we do in the health service. Um, the triple bottom line there is, is fairly obvious. It's, uh, we've, we've talked quite a lot about um, uh, financial and other resources, but we, we obviously know more and more about environmental. So when we started 15 years ago, it was really unclear how that would be measured. We thought of all sorts of things. We thought of lots of very complicated baskets of measures. And actually, carbon is one of the kind of short, short hands for measuring that now, which is, is good. Um, we talk about carbon equivalents, so that involves other measurements like uh, water and um, impacts on the, other impacts on the environment. And then there's the social aspect as well. So uh, that can be really difficult to measure. Um, and uh, although we now have the social value, 10%, which is a significant thing, how do we actually measure that? What are we talking about? So lots of work still to do around that and how we standardise those, um, the understanding of what those things are. Uh, and we have, uh, we've worked with lots of different people in the system over the years. And one of the things that I did when we first started was go and talk to um, the energy and estates directors at our local hospital. And um, they were very, they were kind of a bit amused, like, what are you doing here? What do you think, you know, how can you help us? And we said, um, well, we've come to understand that from you. And they basically said, well, we know what we're doing in terms of the electricity supply, we understand it, we've been working on that for a number of years. But what you can really do, what the problem is for us, is the, are the healthcare professionals working in that system. So not a problem, obviously, but they are the ones who are working within the system, and they are, they are the ones that need to take on board the change. So we heard a lot about behavioural change this morning, and um, uh, it's not just, obviously, the buildings and the transport systems and the procurement supplies that need to change, it's the people who use them. So um, one of the things that we've come up with over the years for helping people to engage is, um, is the Green Team competition. It used to be called the Green Ward competition. And we've run that in a number of different hospitals. And, um, and I'll just go through a very few examples. There's absolutely loads. Um, so if you'd like to see more, just have a look at our website. So um, the first one I'll talk about is eliminating low-value appointments from the patient pathway. And this is with uh, HIV services in Northamptonshire. And, um, and basically, most people, who, most HIV patients who are sticking to, their, um, to taking their drugs and are physically stable um, were still attending services and um, basically going through all the same investigations as people who were, who were quite newly diagnosed and, uh, and were considered unstable. So it seems like a really kind of good opportunity to see whether a change that could be made and, um, and, and reduce the resource use. So um, the first things that happened were that uh, there was a definition of very stable patient. We talked, they talked about developing a new pathway, um, which would be more lean, and uh, all, in, all, all patients were informed about the possibility of joining that pathway. The outcomes were, um, were the following, so quite a lot of carbon saved, uh, £45,000 an Adam just for one place, um, sorry, one county, um, and um, possibly more importantly, given what we were, were saying earlier, is that the outcomes uh, for patients were better, so they didn't have to come to the, uh, they didn't have to attend the, um, the appointments, and they saved money, and also, obviously, it, this was an incentive to get stable with their meds, so basically encourage people to, to take their meds properly. A second example is uh, for PPE. We've heard a lot about that as well. And obviously we know that the usage massively increased over COVID. 
Um, Northampton General Hospital uh, carried out a project trust-wide and um, they implemented uh, videos, screensavers, posters and so on um, and updated their policy which enabled them basically to reduce glove use and apron use um, but also to understand why this, this was important. So again, uh, financial savings as well as carbon savings and uh, improvements for staff and patients. Um, and I should say on that one as well that, you know, we talk about prevention, but a lot of the, um, uh, the side effects of people wearing PPE, which unnecessarily was that actually they were spreading infection, obviously not wanting to, but because they were wearing gloves when they shouldn't have been to make beds and to uh, write notes and, and so on. Um, this is another slightly more uh, tech um, intervention using photobiomodulation therapy, uh, which is a sort of light therapy um, for oral mucositis, which is uh, something that basically is like an inflammation and breakdown of the lining, muc mucus lining, um, which can cause a lot of problems, uh, including uh, need for other, other interventions. And the palliative care team uh, at the Christie did this and self-administered um, sessions by patients following cancer treatment basically um, led to uh, outcomes over the trust of £32,000 for just 11 patients. So if that was scaled up to the whole of the trust, then it would have been over half a million. Um, and for patients, this gave them you know, something they could do for themselves Hardly any staff training was required, and uh, patients had fewer side effects. Uh, last one I think I'm going to briefly go through is early mobilisation. And um, this was in a, a cardiac intensive care unit um, where normally the physio team would only work with um, high-risk patients. So uh, the physio team came in and worked with everybody, um, and uh, systematically started uh, working with them after just uh, a day after open heart surgery. And it was 30 minutes, two times a day. And it had quite big um, uh, outcomes, reducing ventilation and stays, saving a um, million two hundred thousand pounds over two years so about six hundred thousand pounds a year and quite a lot of tons of co2 obviously it also improved um, recovery times for those patients so uh, that's better for everybody so I hope those examples just give you a, a kind of flavor of um, of the kind of things that can be done at trust level and quite often these things, are uh, seen by people on the ground, they want to do things, but they don't have the support to do them, and they sometimes don't have the time to step away from what they're normally doing and, and make changes. Um, so we can help them with that. They also don't have the expertise necessarily to measure the changes and to write those up. And one of the things that um, we've noticed uh, over the years is that although there are loads of stuff happening on the ground, and you'll have heard from industry this morning, and you've heard from clinicians, and you've heard from um, the colleges and so on supporting, it's very difficult to find the time to write those up, well, to do a standardised, uh, to use standardised metrics and methods, but also to write those up. So um, it takes more effort and uh, it's, hard, it's hard to justify sometimes, but actually that's a really important thing because you can't share those results unless it's written up and published. Um, and this is more important, in a sense, as we begin to move uh, to working internationally. So a lot of our, um, our community at the moment, so I've got 30 in my team, but we also have about 6,000 people in our networks. And they are, they're designed mostly specialty-based. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, if you're working in healthcare, they, healthcare is, is kind of has natural communities of practice, and those are basically specialties. So some of them are cross-cutting, but a lot of them will be, um, they, you know, they're either primary care or nursing, or, or they might be, for example, mental health or cardiology. Um, and the reason that it's good to work with those specialties is that that is a naturally international community. So if you engage with 
that specialty in the UK and get them working on something, then that can be reasonably easily translated to other countries because all those systems vary. Um, they don't change that much uh, across different countries. So our networks are a really good place to ask questions if you've got them, to share resources if you've got good case studies or tools if you come across things. Um, obviously, they're free to join, and um, we'd welcome any of you joining them. Um, we, we have, along the way, um, developed our capability in uh, sustainability analysis, and it's great that there's lots more people out there doing this now. Um, but we can work with trusts or uh, non-NHS non organisations as well as ICBs and so on to help them to understand what their footprint is and what their, where their hotspots are. And um, if it comes to uh, making changes, um, even if you haven't thought about what they are, we can help you to understand uh, what those might be depending on, on what organisation you're in. Um, and along with uh, other, other things that we do, we have um, a sort of resources and support for that sustainability analysis. So that includes courses, which I know a few of you have been on, um, but also, and the network, but also um, workshops and uh, um, resources like tools and um, case studies. Um, not to be forgotten, but back to the sort of prevention um, bit at the beginning in relation to the four principles of sustainable healthcare. The natural environment, as we know, um, is a really important part of our health. And um, during COVID, lots more of us, I think, connected, reconnected. And um, right from the beginning, we've had, a, we've had a program called the NHS Forest, which is uh, ostensibly about planting trees. Um, we started off planting one tree for every staff member of the NHS. Haven't quite made it yet, 1.5 million, but we've planted about, how many have we planted? Over 100,000. Um, and we have got 150,000 more to give away this year. Just uh, got a big grant from DEFRA and the Forestry Commission. So if you'd like trees uh, on your site, then do get in touch. Um, and the green space work involves all sorts of other things as well. So it's green walking. Um, we have nature recovery rangers who are based on NHS sites, uh, and we do national policy work and education as well. So that's not to be forgotten. Um, and then uh, finally, I'll just m mention our courses because I think, well, over the years, we had people coming to sort of learn from us. We didn't set out to do courses but we sort of ran out of time teaching people individually and, and engaging with people. So we started doing courses about five or six years ago, um, first of all face-to-face, -face, and then with COVID they went online, and we've been able to sort of expand that then quite a lot. So we now do courses which are about four to six hours of self-study and then um, a, a live workshop, either in person or online, which is a chance to listen to other people, share your ideas and your questions. Um, and uh, we're, now, we're now rolling those out in, in other countries as well, so working with both uh, the States and Australia quite a lot um, to offer them similar courses at times that fit with them. Um, so if you're interested in either coming on a course or, a, or developing a new course that you think we'd like to work with you on, then, then get in touch. Um, I think that's enough from me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I really needed to drink a drink.